Good afternoon. I will be talking to you about uh, using curses in Python and also a third-party library, Erwid. Uh, this will just be a high-level level overview of terminal manipulation in Python. Uh, those with NCURSES experience, it will be review. For those without it, um, you might learn something, hopefully. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a web developer, and the IE logo is a joke because IE is, is a difficult browser. Um, I am a PHP turned Python developer as well. Um, I've done PHP, Java, JavaScript, and you know some various things like that. Um, I enjoy learning all things low level. So if it's a language you have to manage your own memory, I'm probably going to like it. And if you deal with pointers, I also probably like it for some reason. Um, the pictures are just representative of low level things, really nothing more. Uh, just a, a diagram on the top and assembly on the bottom. Uh, and I also love computer history. Um, it's a Commodore PET on the top, which is, came out in 77, and an Apple I, which came out in the late 70s, I believe. Uh, if any period of history that I could go back to, it would be the late 70s, the early 80s, because there's just a lot going on. Not that there isn't now, but there's a lot that was very new that we take for granted, and I just like to stay at that level as much as I can. Uh, so where do I work? I work at cars.com, specifically newcars.com in sunny Santa Monica. It's a top-notch company, great management, um, great tech, tech department. We're also a PyCon sponsor. We're very glad to be part of the community, a uh, very vibrant community of humans. And uh, we are a Python Postgre shop as well, uh, migrating from PHP and MySQL and an assortment of technologies mixed in there. Uh, but eventually our goal is to be as Python as much as possible because it's just a great language. Um, and we're an awesome place to work and we are hiring. So if you're interested in working in Santa Monica, um, a gentleman down here named Michael is our hiring manager. You could always talk with him or any of us here in the front row. We're all from cars, except for the gentleman that introduced me though he is still nice and valid. <laughs> okay, so before we get into the rest of the, the actual programming, we need to talk about video terminals a little bit, just set the stage. Um, your terminal identifies itself through a term variable. So this one thinks it's an X term that's capable of 256 colors, which of course means that it thinks it's capable of handling colors. Uh, the tput command lets you query the term info database that most computers have installed, I think pretty much all of them now, to get an idea of terminal capabilities. Um, this one is also capable of moving the cursor around or called uh, direct cursor manipulation. And let's see what happens when we try in Vim, ignore the top line. We try in Vim to use colors, uh, apparently it works. And it's also government approved. So let's switch that back and get out of there. And next, we will try and issue some raw escape sequences and change colors on the command line on our own uh, without the aid of anything but just the, the keyboard. Isn't it amazing how I can talk and also type effortlessly? <laughs> So here I'm printing out uh, a warning message. Um, what's happening here, this is an escape sequence, and these are literal characters. You can get a, an escape sequence by just pressing Control V and then escape, and then the rest follows. It's a command, so this is changing the color to blue, and this is changing the, uh, this is changing the video mode to underline, and then we're printing out the word don't, and then we change it back to default white on black. We print the rest, and then we change it color to red, or actually this video mode reverse and then color to red, or the other way around, can't remember. We print out red and then we reset it and, press the rest, and, and print the rest. So if I wanted to, how could I find out a terminal's full capabilities? If you want the bleeding edge view or blistering eye view, if you will, this is the actual entry for X term in the term info database. And there's quite a lot going on there. And I'll be honest, I don't know what most of these things are, but um, it's very capable as you can see. This is an escape sequence, that's just how you represent it. Uh, switch my notes over. So there's other types of terminals, and in fact, which is why, why we have curses in the first place is because we have so many terminals. So if we tell this terminal that it's a different type of terminal, we can see what happens. So we're gonna tell it that it's a VT100. Is anybody familiar with the VT100? Nice. So clearly it now thinks it's a VT100. And VT100 is not capable of colors. 
And it is capable of direct cursor manipulation though. So if we use Vim and we change the color scheme, nothing changes because the VT100 cannot display colors, or so it thinks. Great. And then we can see what this uh, terminal is capable of. And you can see it's a pretty respectable list, but it is definitely less than the X term, which makes sense because the X term is an emulated terminal. So you're probably going to be able to do everything and then some. So we don't have any hardware restrictions in that case. But this one, uh, this one came out 70s or early 70s. So, you know, it does, it, it does what it can. There was also another type of terminal called the dumb terminal, and that was very, very limited. If you're familiar with um, uh, teletypes, it's very similar to those. Uh, so we can also tell the terminal that it's a dumb terminal. So when we check if it's capable of colors, no, it is not. It's also not capable of cursor manipulation. Well, what is this terminal capable of? Not very much at all. That's like four things. <laughs> so you can pretty much type a command and press enter. And that's about all I can do. You can press enter a lot if you want to try and clear the screen, but it's not going to do much for you. So I'm going to use Midnight Commander this time uh, because Vim is a little too nice and it will try and, and re uh, render itself even if it can't. So if you try and run Midnight Commander, it's not even going to start because you can't. So this is just to fill out uh, inf uh, details on why we, what kind of terminals we have and, and, uh, and their different capabilities. Uh, if you want a more complete list of terminals, this is everything that's in term info right now. So currently, if you write an NCURSIS program, you're actually writing a program for all of these terminals. Well, it will run on as many as it can, as you saw from Midnight Commander. Yep. Okay, so let's skip back here and talk a little bit more about video terminals. First terminal came out around 1969. It was a data point 3300. Um, at least that's the first one I could find. It offered basic line editing, like backspace, finally. A clear line, you can clear the screen. You could move the cursor to any point on the screen. Um, it was quite literally just a monitor and a keyboard attached to a computer via an RS-232 cable uh, or connector. Used the ASCII character set, which was uh, an improvement over the Bado code, which is a five-bit code previously. Um, and it ran at about 300 characters a second, or 300 baud. Um, this is a picture of the VT100, which we saw its mode in X term. It was one of the most popular video terminals back in the day, uh, product of Digital Corporation. It, it ran at 24 lines by 80 columns, which is a default setting in pretty much every terminal out of the box today, so you can see its legacy. Uh, also, there's a lot of support for its escape sequences today still. Uh, most emulators still have a VT100 mode. So talking to a terminal, the kernel would handle all the low-level transfer data details, which you're probably familiar with. Um, it would receive input from the keyboard, would send it through a line discipline, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and, uh, and then it would send it to the user processes. Um, and that's actually still how it works. It's just we don't have any hardware terminals anymore. Or we're, they're not very widely used, I should say. I'm going to switch. So there were no standards. Uh, pretty much every vendor that came out with a terminal had its own set of escape sequences. This is from the VT100. Um, ECMA 48 came out in 1976 and tried to standardize that. 108 pages of uh, very readable codes and explanations. Um, and on top of that, TermCap came out in 1978. I don't have a picture of that. Um, but it basically was a precursor to TermInfo. And it allowed a program to say, what can I do with you, terminal? And um, here's a line discipline picture of it. Uh, it's, I like to say it implements the br bridge design pattern because it bridges the gap between the, the hardware and the software. You can have n number of different hardware devices and n number of software processes. They can all talk through a line discipline. Um, it is glue code. Uh, it is not called outside of this context, and it can't call anything else, really, so it's, it's not alive. It offers two modes, uh, raw and cooked. If you open up a terminal, you are in cooked mode, which means you type a bunch of stuff and press enter, and, um, and then it uh, executes. If you press control C, that becomes a signal. The kernel emits a signal, you know, sig int in that case. Um, if you're in raw mode, everything that you type, including special sequences, goes straight to the program, is not interpreted at all. So introducing NCURSES, finally we come to it. Um, originally developed for BSD back in the day, 
Um, it actually borrowed code from VI, which is my preferred editor of choice. Um, back then, VI had a lot of terminal, like cursor manipulation features. And so, um, uh, and curses, curses at that time took from that, and now Vim borrows from Encurses. So it's a good relationship. Uh, originally used term cap, now uses term info. Um, it was moved to System 3, Unix System 3. It was not, re, was not ported because there were issues. It was re-implemented. Um, it gained new features like color and uh, being able to draw more, uh, draw lines easier and uh, new video modes like bold and underline. And uh, then curses became P curses due to licensing issues and later became N curses. And so we come to today. So why N curses? Well, by now you have the picture that there were a lot of terminals and there were a lot of different ways to talk to the terminals. Um, so the way term info standardized our querying of a terminal, this standardized the way that we can write programs for it. Uh, you write a, an Encurses program and it's going to run everywhere that term info is supported basically, or previously term cap. There are convenient abstractions, like there are windows that you can put. You don't just have to move the cursor, draw a line, you know, move the cursor, put some text, etc. You create a window, pop it on the screen, refresh, and, and you're, you're going. Um, it also had a standardized API, which is, goes right along with its portability. So the philosophy. The tools are provided, but you are on your own. Um, they give you one primary object, which is the standard screen, which represents the entire screen size. Um, you have full control over that. You can have put form, form elements, windows, and colors, and they introduced a new mode, which is character break, which sits between raw and cut. So raw, I just talked about those, you should remember those. Character break, it's gonna break on every character, but it's also gonna interpret um, character sequences like control C. Control Z and all that stuff. So, uh, and also you were you had to refresh the screen manually in the right order, which you'll see in the program. So let's look at a program. Uh, this is the program we're going to build here. It just gets random quotes. At this point, it's just Chuck Norris quotes. If I press R, it gets a new quote. Hopefully, somewhat quickly, it is going out over the internet. Could have been something I fixed beforehand. So. <laughs> And the more you do that, the more it gets you quotes. Sorry about the swearing. I can't control Chuck Norris, unfortunately. <laughs> Pretty simple, but let's build it out and see what it looks like. I hope you all had a chance to read that because I definitely skipped. Early. OK, so we are going to start with a blank screen. We can call this screen an ocean. Right now, there's nothing living in the ocean. But we will fill that ocean <laughs> with code. That's an inside joke for the people that I work with based on a conference a couple years ago. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to fire up Vim, and we're going to import the Curses module. And we're going to start building it out. This is the code that's going to get us our new joke. Uh, you can see it's just grabbing a string off online and then translating nothing big. Please don't judge the code. It is definitely simplistic. Uh, then we're going to create our screen. This is going to issue some escape sequences to the screen. The terminal, it's going to create some internal data structures. All very boring. Um, and then we are going to s t tell the, the terminal, don't echo my characters as I type them. We're going to set it into character break mode, and we're going to hide the cursor. And then we're going to check, does it have colors? OK. If so, then start the colors. And then if optionally, if you want to receive keys like uh, F1, F2, all those, those are multi-byte character sequences. So you got to tell curses that you're expecting those and to let them in unharmed. Oops, back one. OK, and then we have to tell curses we need to use these colors. Um, so this is foreground, and this is background. So four, foreground, background, and we have three of those. So we haven't actually built the UI yet. So now we're going to add um, the top line. So the first line here adds the random quotes in reverse, and then it fills the rest of the line. So the effect of these two lines is basically pops the random quotes in, and then it finishes off the line. And then we are going to put the menu at the bottom, which basically does that. Uh, this this uh, demo here doesn't have color there, but um, these two lines are going to add color. And it's very low level. You can see you're going down to the last line, seventh character. You're turning on bold and color pair two, which is green. And you're saying just re-render re that in green. 
Same with the Q. So that's the R. Same with the Q. It's going to be red. And then we're going to create a new window, and that's the quote window right here. And uh, hopefully you can see that border. Uh, we haven't actually put the border around it. I'm just doing that for visibility. Um, next, we're going to do the little text window, which is invisible, which, which is why it's uh, dotted like that. Um, but that's where the text is going to go. And that, that way we can re-render this inner part and not touch the outer part. Because if you, if you refresh things in the wrong order, you can actually overwrite your own changes. Uh, and then we're going to add some text right in there. I'm sorry, I went a little quickly. Ten minutes. Okay, so, and then we're going to create the box which actually does this border. A little quicker. And then we're going to refresh the two data structures. Notice we do the standard screen first and then the quote window. If we do it in the other way, the standard screen will cover the quote window. So it's a little tricky. And then we're going to update the screen all at once. Then we're going to do our uh, event loop. This is just a basic event loop. We're going to catch uh, the input every time. If it's an R, we're going to clear the text window. We're going to say get in quote and refresh it. Then clear it and then put the new joke in. If it's Q, then we're going to break out. And at the end of the loop, of each loop, we're going to refresh from the bottom up. So screen, quote window, text window, and then draw the screen again. And the, the reason you do this is so you avoid flickering. And then if we've broken out of it, we're going to reset the terminal, get, get out of character break mode, turn echoing back on, and then show the cursor, and then we're going to end. And that's all you have to do in order to write a simple curses program. So now, in the little bit of time that I do have left, let me save this in front of you, and then talk about Urwid. Urwid is a third-party library that does a lot of the work in curses does, a little differently. Urwid is pronounced Urwid. It's German for ancestral, so it's basically ancestral widget, uh, which is kind of a play on how old Encurses is. It's got a layered architecture, which is very much different from Encurses. So you can see you've got display modules, widget layout, which is where your UI is, and then you can have different event loops that actually control it. Um, because it's layered, you can do things like this. By default, you have a raw display in Urwid, which handles the console, but you can use the curses. But because it uses raw, it can actually do more things, like the high color mode, 256 colors, which you can't do with curses um, that I'm aware of. You can also have a web display, so it's kind of like a web server, but that's not quite developed yet. And then an HTML fragment, in case you want to have screenshots, which you can see on their website. Widget layout is how we create our UI. Um, the, I don't have enough time to get into how these play together, but there's uh, a lot of detail on how it passes control back and forth. But basically, you compose widgets. It's clearly the decorator pattern in action. And then event loops, um, by default, they give you their own, but you can also use uh, Twisted, or you can use G-Events event loop. Those hook in re relatively easily. So let's look at a program in Erwid, or the same program in Erwid, actually. Type quickly, computer. OK, we're at 2x, good. OK, so we're going to import Erwid. Um, then we're going to set up our palette. And it's much simpler, as you can see. We just define a list of tuples. Uh, this is the name, and then foreground, background. If you want to do something special and fancy like bold, it just becomes a comma-separated value there. Then we're going to create our header. Now, this is a text widget, and we're going to decorate that into a, an attribute map which basically spreads out the title bar attribute, which is the reverse uh, black, white on black, or whatever it was. Um, and that's all you have to do for that. And then we're going to create the uh, menu at the bottom. So you can use a text widget again, and you're going to give it uh, an iterable, which has a bunch of different uh, text snippets. If you do a tuple like this, you can tell it, for this one character, this many characters, use this, these properties. So it's easier to you know, pinpoint. Yes? Oh, is it? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that's going to be tough because I pre-recorded this. <laughs> has, has it been tough the whole time? Yeah. And nobody has said anything. <laughs> well, I apologize. Um, you know what I can do is this. Does that do anything for you, yeah. like, yeah. as a it's human? Well, I really apologize for that. If I do another talk, I'll have to remember that. We'll watch the video later. It'll be great. Great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now again from the
off. And now, yeah, now I can't see the keyboard. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll be good. Okay, so now we're going to create the quote box. Uh, we're going to use another text widget, but we're going to we're going to uh, decorate that with a filler widget, which um, uh, sorry, it distracted me. Um, the filler widget is going to give the text widget um, dimensions, because by default you can't just shove a text widget onto the screen because it doesn't have any dimensions yet. So we're going to put it in a filler, and that's going to align it towards the top, and that's going to put a border around it, or just like an invisible border on the top and bottom. We're going to decorate that into a padding widget, which will put the um, invisible border on the left and right, and then finally in a line box, which is going to put the border around it, the visible border. So the same thing that took us upwards of 10 or so lines in curses is actually very easy with the right widgets in Irwid or Urwid. And then we put it all together in a layout using a frame, which expects a, heady, a, a header, a body, and a footer. So we're just going to feed those in. And that is all it needs to get started. And then we're going to add our joke. Um, logic, which is the same as before. One function to handle all the input, because this is r a really simple example. Um, and then we're doing the same thing, but you can see it's three lines as opposed to five or six or whatever it is. Um, instead of uh, breaking out, we just raise the main loop, the exit. And then we're going to create the main loop, giving it the layout. We're going to give it the palette and say, when you get a keystroke, send it to this guy. And then we're going to run it. Oh, and then we're going to see my mistake. And then we're going to run it. And it works. And let me just back up real quick. So stop playing. Very good. OK, so that's, that's basically that. Um, if you want to know more about Incursus or Irwid, um, then you can look at these links here. There's a lot of information. Irwid has is, is actually been around for a while. And I'm sure some of you have used it. It's got a lot going for it. But I just didn't have time to get into a lot of examples, things, or so I thought. So. At this point, it looks like I do have a little bit of time left. Are there any questions? Are there any, any questions? I know I'm supposed to have thought of something. It was oh, uh, great. Here we blisteringly go. fast. Um, yeah, how would you do a timer in N curses? A timer? Like if you wanted to have a clock and it was counting down or something in the top corner. Uh, you'd have to set up your own loop. That, that would just get down to Python. I think I heard somebody saying at uh, in the the booths were still going on. Like, if you're using Pyramid and you're trying to do something, it's just Python. It's like you end up setting up that loop. And then you just have to refresh the screen every so often and keep it updated. Very manual, you know. Can you talk a little bit about the twisted event loop integration? I could try to, but I haven't actually used it yet. Um, essentially, I know Twisted gives you lots of features as far as uh, asynchronous uh, tasks and things like that. I'm going to sound really dumb if I try and talk about it, but essentially it's just a different way to, um, to farm out responsibilities. So I'm sorry I can't be much help in that. Uh, but they do have some documentation on the website. I would point you to this one, this gentleman right here. Obvious question, but perhaps with an obvious answer. So why would I use cursors to do something these days when I can build a, a GUI so easily on my desktop? Right. Well, actually, my interest in this comes from uh, my work. A lot of the stuff that I do is, is from on remote terminals. And it's hard to have an X server running on those. So it's just easier for me to fire up something like Midnight Commander and to, uh, you know, that and as well as uh, hardware that's really limited. There's no reason to go around getting an X server running when every, you know, Every Linux install has a console out of the box. Then if it has a console, well, then you, you've already got a UI. And in most cases, it's sufficient unless you've got to do graphics. Then you've got to get into frame buffers, and that's a whole different thing, unless you just go with an X server. Yeah, basic answer. So uh, as a happy Raspberry Pi owner, mm -hmm. and I'm not using this type of setup, and I'd like to, uh, since you've researched both types of libraries, which one would be easiest to jump into? Uh, oh, as far as Curses or Irwood? Yes. Well, to be honest, they both have their learning curves. Um, Irwid does a lot more for you. You know, a, a few lines of code go a long way, but you got to know how it thinks. Uh, Curses is just much more step by step. You literally do everything you want to do step by step. So I'd say Irwid will get you going faster, um, but it's good to know how to do curses. And that way I've made everybody happy. That answer. Yes. Uh, since 
terminals are usually ASCII. What happens when n curses comes across like a Unicode character or something like that? Good question. I know that support for a Unicode can be spotty with n curses, especially at the C level. Um, so I believe Python has some ways to handle that. Uh, that'd be worth some research. I know Urwid has um, enhanced Unicode support, like it actually deals with, you saw my examples were Unicode characters. So um, curses, I'm not too sure. Uh, it has a library S link. There's an S link. There's a library S language. Basically, when you compile in curses, it actually accommodates that. There's an alternative. I can't remember what it is, but most installations now come with it. So there's support, as far as I know, just out of the box. Cool. There you go. So, so as a programmer who writes, you know, tools that run the command line, <coughs> I, I tend to uh, use the command sequences, the ANSI sequences, to get the coloring to show up. Um, mm -hmm. I've been told you should use in curses or something else like that, but. I haven't really seen that I can use these types of setups for, you know, it's a classic terminal that's just spitting text out, but I want color to show up, you know, in the bold or red or green or like that. Can you do those type of things within curses? Is, or is it just always a frame buffer you show up and everything's lost once you work the program? Such as, it, like, you basically still have a terminal, but it just has color support? Yeah, yeah. So instead of me, like, knowing all the special sequences, I can just sort of say, you know, it'd be nice to be able to say just, you know, red, green without making my own infrastructure. It seems like you should be able to reuse. There's actually, uh, there's actually two ways I can think of to do that. That tput command lets you set colors. If you're going to just be straight, you know, going into a script, I'm not sure how recommended it is to use that, but you can use friendlier names with that. Um, also with curses, um, well, you saw how you could switch. Um, you could switch colors with those color pairs. If you're going to use curses, there's going to be a little bit of setup. I know it does support the scrolling text with a little yeah, bit of so, work. Yeah, so it's like being able to say I have a you know, Python print, and I'm saying print something, and I can, you know, I usually just pop the color sequences in there, and basically right. magic with, happens, right? So With curses, you'd, you'd have to set up your color pairs. So it's, you'd say, I'm going to use these colors overall, and then you just say a knit pair, and you say color pair, whatever number it is, and then it's going to switch to that, and then it'll issue those. <laughs> Does that get close to what you were asking? Yeah, I guess but the main thing is, at least from my experiment, there's always to be the standard screen. And you turn the standard screen on, everything on the console disappears. It's sort of backed up, right? Yeah. Stuff shows up on the screen, and once the program ends, everything on the screen disappears, which seems to sort of defeat the whole purpose of you know terminal redirection and stuff along those lines. So and that's where I was sort of thinking, well, it seems like I would have to do it myself, because it seems like this is the notion of making a, you know, a CUI, you know, a console-based UI, in a sense, versus a graphical one. Um, so you, you're talking about using it to kind of augment, make it easier to uh, to use some of these escape sequences without having to clear everything and kind of take over. Yeah, the yeah. Type because thing. I mean, I, I mean, it's, when doing console programming, basically getting colors on the screen is really sort of useful. Mm -hmm. You know, it bolds, prints things out for things that are important, especially if you're doing like you know, for me, like build systems, because you know, air red shows up and a lot of stuffs going by. You can see that red color and see something was wrong. Right. Yeah, I know it's possible to do, but uh, I couldn't give you like a formula right now to do it. But right. I know it's used, uh, programs like Telnet use it, even though they don't use colors, from what I understand, which doesn't clear the screen, but it still gives a little bit more control. So it is possible to use it incrementally, if you will. But that's about all I have to offer on that. Right. Yeah. I was just curious. Um, you said that uh, using the NCURSES library lets you do much more low level things. Um, but using Erwood gives you the widgets that you can. Does Erwood get in your way at all? Say if I wanted to implement something like a roguelike game where I'd want very specific direct control for each character and moving them around in particular ways. Would, if I used Erwood, if I, if I started with Erwood, would I run into problems because I couldn't get low level character access? Right, right. Is it so high level that you can't get down and do right. something? Uh, so two things come to mind. One is uh, you, like for example, Erwood automatically refreshes the screen for you, but if you need to, you can drop down and just take the main loop and say draw screen, which I did in the example. Um, so that's a case where you normally don't have to worry about it, but you'd ha you needed to do it. Um, another case was uh, was the uh, the raw display that Erwood uses by default doesn't support all the older terminals. So actually your program out of the box wouldn't run on those. You'd have to tell it to use the curses module. So you can do that, but it's a, they're behind settings. Uh, it's not that hard to get to, but, um, but yeah, you get like, I'd say all new terminal functionality out of it. And if you have to do something for older ones, 
it'd be a couple more lines of configuration. Great talk, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Um, I'm afraid that's actually all the time we have for questions today. I would encourage everyone uh, after this to go to the uh, Mission City Ballroom for the closing address and afternoon lightning talks. It should be fun as always. Uh, I'd also like everyone to give a big round of applause and thank you to Sean for his talk. Excellent, thank you.